Thank you, Shane, for coming on and joining me on the podcast today. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, you're well known for Farnham Street or FS.blog, as many people know. Um, also writing, you know, Brain Food Newsletter and uh, hosting the Knowledge Project podcast, which has been one of my personal favorites for years. And it's been a huge help in uh, preparing for a lot of guests that I've had on this show. You've had a lot of, uh, there, there's a lot of overlap between them. So it's been great. I listened to that over the years and, you know, you're coming out with a, a new book called Clear Thinking, Turning Ordinary Moments into Extraordinary Results. And that's set to come out in uh, early October, I believe October 3rd, 2023, depending on when this comes out. You know, had the chance actually to to go through the the galley copy. Um, so I already was able to, to dig pretty deep. Uh, I'm looking forward to sort of other people being able to do the same. Uh, I think the best place to get started would be for those who aren't as familiar with you or with Farnham Street or you know, sort of anything in your universe uh, to sort of tell your story from as early as you're willing to start to, to where you are today and talk about uh, some of the decisions you made along the way. Sure. Um, you know, I was a misfit kid, straight D student until grade 10, got in a lot of trouble in school. I mean, my, my grade nine teacher wrote my report card that I'd be lucky to graduate high school. I was back when teachers actually said what they thought and she wasn't wrong. And grade 10 sort of like turned things around. I had a new peer group, went to a new school, uh, got in with the smart kids. My best friend's dad pulled me aside. I don't know, it must have been October, November. And he basically, we were, we were having dinner at his house one night and they were talking about university. And I didn't even know what university was. And he just, he pulled me aside and he didn't embarrass me, but he did pull me aside very sternly, basically said, Hey, if you're not going to university, you shouldn't be hanging around my son because I, I don't want people in his life that aren't going in the same direction as him. And I said, you know, I don't even know what university is and <laughs> what are people talking about? And he said, I'll help you, but like, you, you gotta, you gotta do this. And he, uh, he made a big difference in my life and sort of like got me on the right path. And, you know, my grades went from D's to A's, uh, started hanging around smart people. And then I went to university, got a job at an intelligence agency, did computer science undergrad. And I started working for a three letter agency two weeks before September 11th. And obviously the world changed September 11th, uh, 2001. And I got thrust into these roles and responsibilities. We all did, everybody working there. I mean, great people, talented people got thrust into jobs they weren't really ready for. Nobody, nobody said, go home, get ready for this, come back tomorrow. You're gonna, you're gonna do these jobs. You just had to dive in and do them, figure them out the best you could. And the reason I tell that story is, is Farnham Street is a byproduct of that because I wanted to get better. Uh, at making decisions for not only for me, but for my country and for all the people working with me and for all the other countries and allies and the troops and theater that we're supporting. And so Farnham Street became this um, journal of what I was learning. But of course, it wasn't called Farnham Street then. It was like 68131-1440.blogger.com, which if you go to today, some guys like can seem to don't go to the website. But it wasn't really intended for anybody else. It was just intended for me. I worked for an intelligence agency. I wasn't allowed to have a public profile. I wasn't allowed to have a name or a life or anything that existed online, uh, all of that stuff. So everything was done like super anonymously, not completely, but it would have been really hard to figure out who I was uh, from the way that I set it up. And it was never intended for anybody else to read. It was just me. And it was my reflections on the stuff that I was learning from, you know, Daniel Kahneman and Warren Buffett and Nassim Taleb and Charlie Munger and all these sort of people who influence my thinking, people who disproportionately make good decisions in the real world. Because I want to know, you know, I, I, I did my MBA and all of that stuff is so academic. It's like fill out the spreadsheet and do all these things. Nobody does that in the real world. They might think like that, but nobody actually goes through the models and the complexity. No, there, there's got to be a better way to do this. And so that was, I was like trying to find this better way and trying to synthesize different connections between people. How are these people able to continuously, continuously get better than average decisions? And so it's not luck. They must be doing something different. And that sort of started my 
exploration on decision making and thinking and trying to master the best of what I could from other people. I mean, I can't figure all this stuff out. Nothing we write about is my idea. Even the book is just an amalgamation. It's my synthesis of other people's ideas. There's almost nothing original in there. It's really just me connecting things in a way that I haven't seen done before, in a way that really resonates for me and in a way that I hope resonates for other people. Like we talk about the importance of positioning before you make a decision and, and nobody talks about that. And yet, if you look at sort of the greats in history, Rockefeller, Carnegie, Buffett, Kaufman, like it doesn't matter if you look at all of them, what you find is that they're never out of position and they're always able to take advantage of whatever situation um, comes. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad. If you look at Warren Buffett, they have 150 billion on the, the balance sheet in cash right now. If the stock market goes up he's going to win. If the stock market tanks, he's going to win. He's always going to win because he puts himself in the right position. And I think that that's one of the key lessons that I learned is like, how can we position ourselves for success? And then fast forward, people started reading the blog. I don't I have no idea how they found it. Um, I changed the name because I used to get all these emails to my anonymous email account, you know, sort of about uh, your URL is the worst URL in the history of the web. And uh, I, I love your your writing and I want to read more of it, but I hate your URL. And so I changed it to Farnham Street, which is an obvious sort of like homage to Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. So 68131 was the zip code for Berkshire Hathaway. 1440 was the unit number in Kewitt Plaza. Uh, and that was my way of just sort of uh, thanking them and acknowledging their role in my life. And then I think, what, 2014? 14, 2015, I get divorced, I quit my job, I start Farnham Street, like for as a business at that point. And then, you know, the rest is sort of history. That was the point where it became unanonymous. Great. Well, uh, thank you for sharing the story. It's definitely uh, quite unique. I haven't had anyone on the podcast yet who's been part of an intelligence agency, or at least no one who's revealed that information to me as of yet. Uh, and uh, I also haven't had that many people who are, who at least started what they're doing uh, in an anonym, anonymous or pseudonymous fashion. Um, that's the way that sort of I've been doing my thing, you know, on the internet for the last few years or so, um, and sort of had my own rationale. But um, it sounds like yours was more so out of need than anything else, where you can't really go and have a public blog or, or whatever it might be under your own name when you're working for this intelligence agency. But I'm curious sort of how you um, navigated going from that anonymous start to eventually sort of revealing yourself what pieces of that um, sort of, you know, after that you realized, wow, this was, you know, great that I did this for X, Y, or Z reason. Um, other parts that may have been sort of regrettable in a way, uh, or not regrettable, but um, just sort of acknowledging the trade-offs of being, you know, your your full name and and your face and everything online versus this anonymous author, um, and you know how you how you went about sort of ultimately making that decision. Well, I mean, if I could do it all over again, I'd probably still be anonymous. To be honest with you, um, it, it's hard to be anonymous when the New York Times writes a profile on you <laughs> and outs you. Um, so, so, you know, it was a slow phase in of my name my first name and then my last name. And, you know, I set it up so that, you know, I want to protect my kids. And, you know, when you have an online following that's rather large, you have to think about these things in terms of personal security. You know, I've had incidences with uh, stalkers. Uh, there's a lot of things that go into revealing yourself online. And I'm very cautious about what I do. So I only talk about ideas. I don't really talk about my life. I don't talk about some of the other businesses we're involved in that much. I just want to put ideas out there for people so that they can master the best of what other people have figured out. That's what I do. That's uh, I'm learning that every day. I'm trying to apply these lessons. I'm sharing those lessons with other people. Um, but I didn't, you know, the the intelligence agency, I let them know about the blog when it was anonymous. Uh, little while after it was done. I mean, uh, people there started reading it before I sort of revealed that I was writing it. And that was a bit of a, a weird kick in the butt. My boss came into the office one day and he's like, hey, have you seen this? You should read this. 
this guy, uh, this guy's got some good stuff to say. And I was like, Oh my God, like I wrote that. <laughs> um, and that, that was sort of like, Oh God, I'm going to get in trouble if I don't sort of tell them that it's me. So I, I went to security and said, Hey, I write this anonymous website. And they, you know, they, they weren't super favorable on that idea, uh, because they had to go through everything and make sure I wasn't talking about anything that was like secret or any, you know, writing any codes to the, to foreign nations or something in there. And, uh, you know, it sort of was an eye opener for me in terms of like, Hey, I want to do this and I want to share these ideas and I don't want that to be a problem at work. And things are a lot different now, but like, this is in the, the post Edward Stone sort of like post Bradley Manning time when, uh, they thought differently about this stuff in the immediate aftermath of those sort of things. They thought a lot differently than they do today. And I think they've come a long way to opening up. Um, but I would say, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't reveal, like, if you look at my Instagram account, there's no pictures of me. There's like one picture, which is my profile picture. It's the same picture I use everywhere. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about other people and I want it to be about ideas and I want it to be about how you can use those ideas to achieve a meaningful life, to make better decisions, to build better habits to live just a better life, to fulfill your sort of potential. And I think that I, I sort of like juggle or walk a fine line between these two things where, yeah, my name is public. Uh, our office address legally has to be on every email, which, you know, I have a little bit of qualms about. We've had random people show up at the office sometimes. Uh, but otherwise, I live just this private, normal life. Uh, I'm incredibly private. And, uh, you know, I'm... I'm very hesitant to reveal a lot of details of my life just because of the nature of what I used to do. Yeah. A couple sort of things, maybe directions that I'd like to go with that. Um, a lot of what you said definitely resonates. And I think one of the sort of, uh, interesting maybe paradoxes of pseudonymity is, uh, it's sort of ridiculous to like worry about the things that are worth worrying about related to pseudonymity when you're getting started, because you have like, you know, no one's following you, you're not doing anything. And you don't have any stalkers and no one's showing up at your office. But it's something where you can't put the genie back in the bottle. So or at oh, least yeah. it's difficult. And so you sort of have to anticipate all of those possibilities and have the conviction that it's worthwhile to sort of do it this way. And, you know, despite the fact that it might sort of make the journey a little bit harder, or at the very least, like, sort of like you said, you know, people were, you know, emailing you and saying, Hey, this is the worst domain name ever. You need to change it so that, you know, more people will find this great stuff. Um, pseudonymous is maybe a less extreme example of having a zip code as your domain name, but even still, it's like people like to see a face and, and sort of know your full name just because that's what people are used to. I think it sort of helps with trust and things like that. And so it's almost like, I sort of think of it as playing on hard mode. And if I didn't start that way, I, I probably wouldn't have had the conviction to sort of go that direction. But, you know, your book, you talk a ton about defaults uh, in a little bit of a different setting. But for me, setting the default as pseudonymity up front, I haven't yet sort of had the conviction to break it. And it, I think it's very much a spectrum where, you know, people in my personal life know what I'm doing and things like that. But sort of like you said, it's pretty hard for people to to figure it out just online. And it's very much a spectrum. So like you said, you know, you share you know, you might have one picture on your Instagram. It's like the same as your cover photo. I'm sure if you changed your profile picture or whatever, you know, maybe did a few things. Um, yeah, you're, you're not pseudonymous. Anyone can sort of look you up and probably, you know, find out some stuff or whatever. But, you know, there's a Wikipedia page that reveals the identities of Daft Punk or, you know, maybe like the gorillas or something like this. And yet, you know, I don't really know what they look like or what their full names are. I just know them as Daft Punk and I know like they wear, the, they wear these masks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think there there is like maybe you can sort of partially put the genie back in the bottle just by sort of managing your existing uh, sort of like the, the places where the most people see you online, make them have to go a level deeper. And just by, you know, sort of by the way people are, they won't do that. Um, but it, it's an interesting question. And you're one of sort of the bigger uh, audience people I've been able to talk to who started pseudonymously and then sort of flipped the other way. And so it's, it's very interesting to, uh, sort of hear your perspective on that. But, um, 
you started, you know, towards the end of your story, you're talking about positioning and um, this comes up in the book as well. And you mentioned sort of as an example, you know, Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway, they've got a ton of cash on the balance sheet in a very specific way. That's excellent positioning where they're sort of able to take advantage of a dip in the market at any point. Um, but they've also got enough, you know, in play with assets that they'll do quite well if things continue to go up. Are there other sort of uh, domains uh, you can sort of use to introduce this concept of of positioning and talk about sort of the importance of of maintaining strong positioning to sort of improve your lot in life? 100%. So it, if you think of clear thinking, it boils down to, to three things, as I outline in the book, positioning, managing your defaults, thinking independently. Thinking independently, managing sort of your emotions, your ego, your, your social pressure, uh, even your animal instincts. I mean, that's been talked about a little bit before, but the aspect in the book that has never been talked about to my knowledge is positioning. And you can, there's always something you can do to improve your position. And this is a really key point, no matter what situation you're in, no matter where you're starting from, there's always something you can do to put yourself in a better position. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of positioning that might resonate with people from different domains, right? So like low debt, saving money, investing your money. Uh, but what about sleeping, working out, eating well, investing in your relationship with your partner? If you think of a patch of grass between you and your partner, and you don't invest in that relationship, well, that grass dries out. And what happens when grass dries out? Any little spark is going to start this inferno. But if you invest in your relationship, if you position yourself to withstand the inevitable ups and downs, the bad moods, the bad days, then you're you're going to just come out the other side so much stronger. But there's another element of positioning, which I, here's the key that I think we miss. And I'll explain it through a story that happened with one of my kids, because I think it really relates to how we think about doing our best and how we position ourselves. So one of my one of my kids came home one day and he he handed me a test and it was like the worst test he had ever done in his life up until that point. And I'll, I'll preface this with he goes to a really hard school, uh, and so like his his this was a hard test like this test kicked his butt, uh, and he's like I did my best and he like storms away like any little teenager would do right and I'm like this is not the moment to talk to him about this but I really want to talk about what does it mean to do your best so he calms down and you know later on that night after dinner we sort of talk about like what do you when you tell me you did your best what do you mean and he's like well I sat down I read all the questions I concentrated on them and I did my best and I was like oh that's really interesting you know what you're missing there? You're missing positioning. What position were you in at the moment you sat down to write the test before you ever knew what question was on it? And he's like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, did you fight with your brother? He's like, yep. Did you eat a healthy breakfast? He's like, no, I was running late. And I was like, did you get a good night's sleep? He's like, no, I was running late because I didn't get a good night's sleep and I slept in. And did you study in the three or four days leading up to your, your test? And he's like, no, I kind of half-assed it. And I was like, so you put yourself in a position where you're playing on hard mode and you're not playing on easy mode. And all of those things that go into positioning are within your control. These aren't things that are sort of like luck or chance. Now, if he had done all of those things, if he had studied and prepared diligently like he knows how to, he got a good night's sleep like he knows how to, ate a healthy breakfast like he knows how to, avoided arguing with his brother to, to drive his emotions higher, and he shows up and he gets the exact same grade, man, I'm going to high-five that kid. Sometimes life just kicks your butt. You put yourself in a position to be successful. You did what you could. You controlled what you could control. And that test kicked your butt. That's fine. But that's not the case here. That's not what happened here. You put yourself in a bad position. You show up. You do the best you can at the moment you show up. And then the test kicks your butt. And you're like, well, I did the best I could. Well, that's not an excuse. And this is what happens in real life. We do this. We, we show up at a meeting. We wing it. We don't rehearse a presentation. We do it on the fly. We don't put ourselves in a position for success. And if you think about decision-making, the smartest person in the world who finds themselves consistently in poor positions is going to make, I mean, when you're in a poor position, every possible 
decision you can make is bad. And the circumstances often think for you. You're forced to do something. But when you're in a good position, even an average person looks like a genius when they put themselves in a good position. Because all the options when you're in a good position are good. Again, coming back to Buffett and what we talked about, stock market goes up, great for him. Stock market stays the same, great for him. Stock market tanks, great for him. All of his options are great. He can take advantage of whatever happens. And that's how we have to think about decision-making. It's not just how do I be more rational in the moment that I'm making a decision and how do I control my emotions and manage my emotions? It's how do I think about what position I'm going into this with and how do I improve that position so that more of my options are good and fewer of my options are bad? Because if I can end up in a situation where all my options are good, I'm going to look like a genius. Yeah, I, I love the word positioning even because the closest alternative I could sort of think of might be like preparing or preparation. But if you were talking to your kid about preparation, it's like, I'm sure he studied. There's something different about, you know, positioning where it's it's not just preparing necessarily, it's it's putting yourself in a great position with all of those things that, you know, you can do the night before and in the morning. So I'm curious, you know, in your life, uh, when it comes to whether it's sort of like the generic case of positioning yourself to have a great day uh, or a specific case that is, you know, very interesting for me of positioning yourself to record a podcast uh, when, you know, you're on the other side of the microphone and you're hosting uh, the knowledge project, um, either the generic or the specific or both. I'd, I'd be very curious to hear sort of fundamentals of positioning for you, things that you do. Well, you have to look at where you want to go, right? So which direction am I going? What destination am I headed towards? And you can think of this backwards. What would a person who achieves that, what would they have to do? How do I position myself to do that? I think, you know, if you look at the podcast, it's like if I show up and I haven't prepared for the interview, if I invite a guest on the Knowledge Project and I'm totally disrespectful to them and I haven't prepared, and I do that a couple of times, like it's going to erode all confidence in the show, not only from a listener's perspective, but from a guest's perspective. And that quickly just erodes everything. So positioning is key. I have to prepare before I show up. That means I have to think about the time it's going to take. This is why we release one podcast every two weeks, because I can't do the positioning on a weekly basis with all the other things going on in my life. You think about writing, you know, it's really important to me for continuous personal development, for learning, for mastering the best of what other people have talked about. How do I position myself so that I have time to do that? Well, with very few exceptions, I don't really take meetings before 12 o'clock. This is an exception because we're doing a, a book promo this month and we're, I'm just doing a whole bunch of podcasts, but starting, you know, October 3rd, the day the book comes out, I'm coming back to like, my mornings are mine and you know, my rule, I, I have a whole bunch of automatic rules for success. And one of my rules, and this relates to positioning is that I don't take meetings before 12. I, I, I want that time for me to work on the most important opportunity and the most important thing. And that most important thing might not be business related. It might be just walking the kids to school. It might be uh, you know, cleaning the house because it's just a mess and it just doesn't matter what it is. I don't have to find time to do the most important thing. I think too often we don't think of like how we're positioned. We come home. Here's a great example. You come home, you know, it's been a long day. You're behind at work. You just picked up the kids. You're late. They're angry and cranky. You walk in the door. Your partner's angry and cranky. Everybody's just cranky. You're, you you need to leave that stuff at the doorstep. If you think of visual a visualization of this is like, how am I positioned for tonight when I walk in the door, man? You're not positioned really good. And what's going to happen if you haven't invested in that relationship, if you don't have a strong connection and you haven't done all the work before then, well, man, that's going to blow up. You're going to have a lot of problems. And all the energy that you put towards fixing those problems comes at the expense of deepening your relationship, having fun, building deeper connections. And I think it's just really important to think about what is it you want to do? Where is it you want to go? How do I position myself to succeed? And often what happens is a lot of people want financial independence. This is a great example. And the problem is they want it tomorrow instead of wanting it long term. And a lack of patience changes the outcome. But if you want to position yourself for long-term financial success, you're probably going to do a little bit. You, you know, you're not going to over-lever yourself. You're going to save money every month and you're going to invest that money. 
You want to position your, yourself for success tomorrow. Well, what are the things within your control that have nothing to do with what you actually do for a living? Well, you know sleeping is super important. You know eating well and healthy is super important. You know that working out is super important. You know these three things are important, and yet they're the first things that go when we get busy. You know, your sleep goes, you try to work longer, you stop working out, you stop eating well, and gradually your position erodes, and then you, your emotions start to take over. And what happens when you're emotional? You make really bad decisions. You don't actually make decisions. You're, you instinctively respond to a situation without thinking. And why? Because you're tired. You, you're not healthy. You haven't eaten well, or maybe you've eaten really poorly. And so you're impulsive. And when you're impulsive, you react without reasoning. We're animals at the end of the day, right? We are biologically programmed to be territorial, self-preserving, hierarchical. Like we, we are programmed like every other animal. The difference that humans have is we have an ability to hit pause and think and reason before we respond. But if we eliminate that ability, if we put ourselves in a position where we don't have that ability through emotion or maybe just circumstance, then we're no better than all these other animals. We're just reacting without reasoning. Often circumstances are thinking for us. Yeah. You, you talk in the book about how, um, you know, there's two types of decisions or, or you call them ASAP versus ALAP decisions. And, uh, they sort of remind me of, you know, Bezos framework for type one, type two. I think there's a lot in common there, but I'm curious, like you talk about sort of, um, you know, these in the book, you also talk about like choices versus decisions. Right. And I think that's roughly sort of what you just mentioned, where you're sort of making these choices all day long. And, there are, a lot of them are kind of on autopilot, but a decision is where you sort of identify something as being important enough where you should take the time, take that pause, not be an animal re reacting to your emotions or, uh, you know, ego or what everyone else is doing or what you've done in the past and actually thinking from first principles about what you should do in this moment. And um, I'm curious how you sort of recognize or, or develop an awareness where those decisions that require that extra bit of judgment and that pause sort of raise a flag or, or raise an alarm in your head where it's like, okay, pause, you know, take some time here. If you've sort of introduced any, um, I don't know how you would even go about it necessarily. This, this is a part that I didn't find a clear playbook for in the book, uh, was sort of realizing when the moments are that you need to pause, uh, most seriously. Yeah. So th there's a couple of things that, that come into play there, right? That there's halt, which is hungry, angry, lonely, tired. But more importantly, how do you counter this biological instinct to just respond? And what we talk about in the book is rituals, using rituals to just center yourself. If you look at professional athletes, um, you know, they bounce the ball the same number of times before they shoot a free throw. If you look at tennis, they bounce the ball the same number of times before they serve. What are they doing in that moment? They're centering themselves. doesn't matter if the last play was the best of their career, or the worst of their career. That's not the point. The point is, how do I be present in this moment? When you find yourself running on autopilot, it's just as simple as a ritual. And I, I, you know, I've talked with the CEO of a Fortune 500 company and he basically said, I just take a deep breath before I respond to almost any conversation question. And that deep breath is his ritual, his way of slowing things down, being focused in the moment to make sure he's not responding in an emotional way and make sure he's not responding in an ego-driven way. The thing is what works for us, what works for me, what works for you might be different things. Each person has to take that and be like, okay, well, how do I use the power of ritual uh, to just insert a pause. Now, this isn't to say that every decision needs to be thought out in this this heavy burden process. We 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 tend to get most decisions correct when we know that we're making a decision. We're taught like you have to think about what career path you're going to take, who you're going to marry, where you're going to live. Like we tend, we know we're making a decision in those moments. It's the decisions that we we end up or the choices we end up making in moments where we don't know we're making a decision that come back to bite us. It doesn't matter if you marry 
you know, the perfect partner for you, if you don't invest in that relationship, you're going to end up divorced. It doesn't matter if you get the best job in the world, the most perfect job, and you thought about it and you worked, you know, so hard to get that job. If you don't show up and bust your butt and go all in, it, it's all for naught. But those are, we don't think of those as decisions. Uh, and yet they are decisions. So it's sort of a matter of reminding yourself the direction you want to go. Uh, are you doing the things that get you there? Are you working on too many things? And then taking a breath before you respond in a lot of these situations, you can count, you know, some people say the alphabet, some people do multiplication. It's just slowing down. You don't have to completely think through the situation in the, the, this rational way. And we talk about in the book, inserting safeguards into the process. And one of the, the safeguards that we talk about is sort of like separating putting a firewall between what the problem is and what the solution is. If you think of an organization, how do we insert a safeguard to ensure that we're not just reacting and responding? Well, you can separate problem definition from problem solution. Instead of one hour long meeting, you can have two 30 minute meetings spaced overnight. You're spending the same amount of time and I guarantee you, you will solve the problem better if you do that because what tends to happen in organizations and meetings of people is people come in you know, you're talking about a problem and a solution. Somebody throws out a problem and it sounds good. And it's sort of like everybody can get behind it. And then you start solving it because you, you're surrounded by a whole bunch of type A people. And what, what do type A people want to do? They want to solve problems. Before you know it, you have a solution to the wrong problem. And so by taking the, the you know, a safeguard, which is inserting this pause between these two things, you allow yourself to think about it. You allow other people to think about it. And you can really come up with a clear picture of what the problem is before you can jump into solution mode. Another one of the safeguards we talk about is the person who makes the decision has to be the one to define what the problem is. That's ownership and accountability around the decision, but it makes sure that the person making the decision takes it seriously. So there's all sorts of little safeguards that you can put in place to make sure that you're not only are you well positioned, but that your defaults sort of like don't drive the bus. Yeah, I think for me, that was probably the most refreshing sort of uh, facet of the book was that, I, you know, I, I love thinking about making effective decisions and have read a lot about it. And there's a lot of books on that. But there's not so many books on uh, doing sort of what, what I would sort of analogize to like increasing your batting average when it comes to these choices that are happening on autopilot or maybe taking a higher percent of th these choices that are coming on autopilot and turning them into slightly more conscious decisions. Um, and that's what I think, uh, obviously there's, there's parts of the book, particularly like the fourth part is very focused on these more intentional decisions that you recognize as such and how to go about making those effectively. But I think the first three parts on, you know, the enemies of clear thinking, namely these different sort of uh, defaults, and then building your strengths and sort of overcoming your weaknesses, uh, or rather, you know, managing and mitigating sort of the the outfall or, or, or you know the consequences of those weaknesses. Um, those three parts, I think, go much towards improving your batting average on choices. And when I think about choices, like to your point, I don't know what percentage, but like ninety percent, ninety nine percent, maybe some ridiculous like ninety nine point nine percent of the quote unquote choices and decisions you make every day are not really deliberated over. They're just sort of done. Like one of the most important decisions or choices I've ever made was to leave one bar and go to another where I ended up meeting my you know girlfriend and now fiance. And that wasn't something I thought about or certainly thought about as important at all, but it was something that led to something which, you know, now I met my partner for life. And uh, it's these little decisions that you sort of make or these little choices that happen throughout the day that I think often have these, you know, huge impacts to your point when you're conscious of a decision, people tend to make them pretty well, but it's the people who sort of are just making all of these choices somewhat thoughtlessly, whether it's sort of just doing what everyone else does because everyone else does it or um, acting on emotion, like you said, or, or whatever it might be, not putting themselves in good positions a lot to make these bad choices. These are the things that sort of lead to a life of you know, maybe one step forward, three steps back or whatever it might be. Um, and that, you know, tiny bit of compounding is sort of working against you rather than for you. I know you talked about sort of time being your friend or, or your enemy, depending on sort of how you're going about these things. So 
Um, you, you never want the situation to think for you. You want to be able to exert independent thinking. And like, for, for example, if you know that you're more impulsive and you're more emotional, I think we call it hangry if you don't eat, well, then don't put yourself in a position where you're going to a meeting and, and you're hangry, right? Like you have to think about that before you go to the meeting. Like we're adults, we're smarter than that. We got to work backwards a little bit here. And, and so there's things that you can do to improve your your natural ability to solve these. There's safeguards we talk about in the book, but there's also positioning. If this, you never want to be a slave to the circumstances. You want to be the master of your circumstances. Yeah, and um, another thing you know you touched on earlier is these automatic rules. You mentioned you know having this protected time in the mornings, which I appreciate you uh, making an exception for to come on the show today. Um, are there other sort of automatic rules that you've introduced in your life that have been most impactful? Yeah, I mean, I have a lot, right? Like one of the automatic rules I used to have when the kids were young was like they would wake up and they would come into my bed and we would cuddle. And that was our time to chat and connect. And, uh, you know, that was just really meaningful. Now that they're teenagers, you know, it's <laughs> things change a little bit, but that was like so impactful for my relationship with them, for them. Another rule I have is like I work out every day. And uh, I, I've told this, I talk about this in the book and a couple of people who've read an advanced copy of the book were like this, I, I implemented this the day I read it. I think it's on page 113. And they're like, it literally changed my life. Like literally changed. I, I got a letter from uh, one of my friend's wives saying, thank you uh, for this advice. Because what happens is you, you, everybody, event, eventually everybody loses the battle with willpower. And eventually everybody starts to negotiate with themselves if you leave a little room. And so if you're the type of person who works out two to three days a week and you find it hard and you find yourself with that little monologue in your head going, I don't feel like it today. I'll do extra tomorrow. These are little lies we tell ourselves. My solution to this, because this is what I was doing, was like, I'm just going to work out every day. I'm not going to negotiate with myself whether I work out. What I might do is reduce the duration or scope of my workout but I'm going to do a workout every single day. And that doesn't mean I go to the gym every day, but it, I might go for like a five mile walk. I might do something else. Uh, it doesn't always have to be the same thing, but like, it's important that I work out every day. So when I wake up and I'm trying to fit this in, I'm just thinking about like, what do I need? It's it's not whether I'm going to work out today. It's like, what what's the scope of my workout today? What's the duration? Some days I can just go to the gym and do squats and then I'll come home. Some days I just go for a walk. And some days I do a really big workout. And, and all of those things are different. But what's key here is the consistency of doing it every day. I don't negotiate with myself over whether I'm going to work out. The no meetings toward to 12 is like another rule. I stop drinking at nine. If I'm out with people I don't know, uh, I invest in an index fund every month. These are just little rules. And you think about, again, going back to direction and destination. A am I moving towards the right direction? Am I, am I getting closer? And is the destination worth going to? But you can work backwards from these things in terms of like, okay, how does somebody achieve this destination? Somebody's already done this before me. How have they done it? Well, what would they be doing? What did they do? How can I do that? Uh, and you don't want to look too far ahead. You don't want to look at people where the gap is huge. You want to look at somebody who's just ahead of you uh, on that, that journey. And if you look at it that way, you can sort of see, oh, well, I want financial independence. And we know saving money, investing in an index fund, dollar cost averaging over a long period of time uh, works and, and maybe it changes in the future, but historically that's been a, a pretty good path to financial independence. So why not just create an automatic rule to yourself where you, you chuck money in every month and that's your rule and it comes out automatically and you don't have to think about it. Um, and you can create all these different automatic rules. And the thing about rules that's really interesting that most people miss is nobody argues with rules. We're taught our whole life to follow rules, but we're never taught how to use rules to our advantage. So you can create these automatic rules for yourself and they work wonders. Like consider being out with your friends, celebrating a big win at work and dessert comes, but you want to, you're trying to be healthier. You're trying to get in shape 
And now you're relying on willpower to say no to this dessert. Well, that's a really tough position to be in. You're like, oh, I don't feel like it tonight. And they'll be like, oh, come on tonight. And you'll be like, oh, you know, I'm trying to cut back on dessert. And they'll be like, you can cut back tomorrow. And you can just imagine the social pressure you're going to be under. But if you tell people, hey, it's my rule, I don't eat dessert. Uh, I'm here celebrating with you. That's great. But my rule is I don't eat dessert. And all of a sudden they're going to be like, okay, you know, if you're consistent in that, it might take two times, but if you're consistent in that, nobody will argue with you and you don't argue with yourself. So the best version of yourself can create these automatic rules for success before you're in the situation so that you've rewired your defaults to be positive defaults instead of negative defaults. All you have to do is follow the rule, which is what you've been taught to do your entire life. Yeah, this combination of setting rules and sort of designing your environment, I think both of them are just so powerful for, um, you know, decreasing the need for willpower, because I've heard some people say like willpower is kind of a fixed thing, you can't actually, you know, increase it or decrease it. I don't necessarily have a strong opinion on that. But at the very least, you make it a lot easier to accomplish what you want to accomplish and live the life that you want to live when you make yourself, you know, when you make it a lot easier to do the things that you want to do, whether that's through rules or you know, not keeping cookies and cake on the kitchen counter or whatever it might be. Um, so anyway, I, I know we're uh, we're up on time here, but I really appreciate you coming on and and talking through all of this and and for writing the book and doing all you've done over the years with the podcast and and everything like that. Um, I know there's a bunch of places to find you online and we've talked about it already, but if there's anywhere in particular you'd like to point people and uh, anything in particular you'd like to leave people with, um, now would be the time to do that. So thank you again. Oh, thanks, man. You can find me at fs.blog and the book is called Clear Thinking, Turning Ordinary Moments into Extraordinary Outcomes. 